The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today's message is the pitfalls, and even the title is important. If you would, if you're a note taker, write the title down: the pitfalls of weed seed. Weed seed. It's a particular kind of attitude. The pitfall of weed seed attitude. And before we get into that, uh, I was always reminded of a story that I read a long time ago about uh, J.C. Penney's. Are oh, you familiar with the? J, the chain, J.C. Penney's. And they had a researcher come in and they found out that the, an attitude of one salesperson, a bad attitude of one salesperson, cost them more money than an inferior product. They prided themselves in not having an inferior product, or at least way back then, I guess. You know, they prided themselves in the fact that we got a good product, but lost more customers because of the attitude of a salesperson. I don't know whether you believe that or not. I believe that with all my heart because I see it in the church. If that attitude doesn't change, I don't mean on the surface, because you can all put on your religious face and you all be innocent. But it's what's in the heart, and we're going to test the heart. My heart, your heart, everybody's heart needs to be tested by God because what? Man looks at the outward appearance. He sees the manipulations, the arguments, the facades, but God's looking at the heart. And I care about God looking at the heart and dealing honestly. All right? And the blame game, if you're a Christian, the blame game should have died when you got born again. You're the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiving people. So... The way the word works <clears throat> with weed seed attitudes, um, there's also another one that surfaced this week that I thought was interesting, and that's self-promotion. Interesting. People say, I don't have any issues. I'm free of issues. It's all those other people that have issues. I don't have issues. But if you're into self-promotion, you have an agenda. And if that's not God, you're in the same amount of trouble you would be as if you had uh, something else. So anyway, um, in Isaiah 50, this is the way the Lord discipled me when I was a young believer and was asking a lot of questions. And he gave me the scripture, Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5, and this would be good for everybody. And that is that he said, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple. Now, a disciple's tongue is not just repetition. He's a voice as opposed to an echo. Do you realize you can be in church a long time and echo information? But it's not really a voice until it's impacted your life. This is why we're such sticklers for the 60-day challenge. Uh, you know, I've seen people come and go, and the ones that couldn't do the 60-day challenge, didn't have time for the 60-day challenge, usually don't last long. Because they think everyone else needs that, not them. All right? But God says, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple. That means you're going to be a voice too, because you're going to own what you're saying. I'll give you the tongue of a disciple that I would know how to speak a word in season to them that are weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as a disciple. God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Uh, the main thing is, is that uh, when you hear from God, or, or God's word begins to discern you, just in, in the overall reading of the scriptures, if it's, it's supposed to discern your heart, it's supposed, before you discern other people, you let the word discern you, and don't fight against it or turn away from it. That was the first illustration, because sometimes he speaks something to you, and it's a corrective word, and you go, eh. But if you were in relationship, and if it was really heart to heart, you would feel the love of God behind even a corrective word. Now, don't fight or turn away from him was lesson number one. And secondly, don't argue with what he's saying. But at the same time, God's word 
wants to build and to plant. Um, and we're talking about weed seed attitudes, Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anybody fall short of the grace of God, lest a root of bitterness spring up. Now, when a root of bitterness springs up, it's a root. We're talking about a weed seed attitude here. We're not just talking about something that's kind of transient, kind of just flashes across your mind momentarily. But it says it springs up, it causes you trouble, and it defiles others. This is where I'm concerned with bad attitudes, when it starts defiling other people. All right? And... Uh, one of the best illustrations, I got this from Jennifer from years ago. Uh, she informed me about Johnson grass. I never heard of Johnson grass, but it's the top, in the top 10 of the most noxious, destructive weeds that farmers must fight. I was a city kid, I don't know what the farmers fought. You know, for me, livestock was pigeons and squirrels. So I, I don't know, but isn't that something? It's in the top 10. 10 of the most noxious, destructive weeds farmers must fight. When it becomes wilted from the frost or hot and dry weather, it can contain enough amount of hydrogen cyanide to kill cattle and horses. That's pretty potent, isn't it? That's a weed seed. Huh? And if it's eaten in quantity, that is. But it grows and it spreads quickly. It completely chokes out other cash crops planted by farmers. I love talking all this farm talk. I don't know what I'm talking about. But unless, unless it is destroyed, it makes the field unusable. Oh, I like this part. It makes the field unusable for both livestock and crop growing. That's pretty potent, and it, it, and it helps explain something that God taught me out of Jeremiah, and we're going to get to that. In the same way, toxic emotions that are rooted in our heart takes on a life of its own. It's poison, our life, but it chokes out the good things that God wants to plant in the heart. All right? And we, we know that toxic emotions get planted at some point. There is a, um, a wounding, a judgment. And uh, I've already told my staff, I confronted them, told them, uh, if you don't shape up, get out. Because attitude determines everything. And I feel that way about church people. If you won't take the biblical approach to something, you, then leave. Because it's that serious. God is What God wants to do is deal with your attitude. And Hosea 10.4 says, They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Therefore judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. It becomes poison in the heart. And it's the number one cause. So there's a reaping in this too. It doesn't just hurt you and defile other people, which is plenty, but it's the number one cause of unnecessary trouble in the lives of believers. So I'm saying we're going to go to war on this at Kingdom Life. We're going to go to war on this. You deal with those attitudes and be real. Don't, don't cover up and pretend like it doesn't exist if your heart is there. And, it needs to be, because the beauty of what God gave us was repentance and forgiveness. And when he does that, the love of God can change the picture. And we've got to be able to change the picture on how we see people. Now, most trouble is really not as much spiritual warfare, but root issues. I know a lot of people say, the devil's attacking me here and the devil's attacking me there. More often than not, the devil does attack, but he also attacks where you have given him ground that he can occupy. So he can, if you have an open door and you've got open ground, he can attack that open ground because you give place to him. You, you give him permission, knowingly or unknowingly. That's the way we, we, we dealt with stuff uh, in the early years of our marriage with Jennifer, right? We would say, Knowingly or unknowingly, you have to admit, you don't know everything there is to know, and you open doors that you don't even know you open doors to. But you can still have the same solution, receive forgiveness for it. Now, um, you don't want to give legal ground to the enemy to attack. Poisons our physical body. And I, uh, there's another one to share uh, her statistics. We're sharing with you today 
that 90%, I don't know where you got this, 90% of all physical diseases. So if you have a bad attitude long enough time, that's uh, your biology becomes your biography. You know, your biography becomes your biology. You're going to harbor something long enough, it's going to change you physically. And it's not for the good. It stunts our emotional and spiritual growth. Now, here was the other eye-opener for me as a young Christian. Um, when it comes to stuff from the past, where, where weed seed attitudes got planted, you can forget about them, but the poison continues to bring trouble into your life. In other words, it's still working. And just because you forgot about it doesn't mean it's not working in you. Emotions don't die. They get buried alive. And so the, the soil of the heart and the seed is the word of God. Those are the good things that God wants to build and plant. Now, what I found totally fascinating is that the scripture corroborates this over and over again, that the word is like seed, okay? And the heart is like soil. In uh, Mark chapter 4, uh, the whole portion of scripture there is on it. But the good news is, uh, we don't have to figure th things out. We often lean too strongly upon our understanding when God's saying, if you would receive with meekness that engrafted word, it's able to save your soul. It's able to bring life where there was death and destruction. If you will allow the word that's implanted. And I like that. It's the implanted and rooted in your hearts. Receive and welcome the word. This is the Amplified Translation. Receive. How do you do that? You open up your heart. Receive and welcome the word which was implanted and rooted in your heart. It contains the power to save your soul or sanctify your soul. So if you want something planted, you want the word planted. But I've got news for you. There's too many people trying to plant the word but never root out the garbage. So, weed seed attitudes, this, is, this was a, oh, I get the chill just thinking about it. This is when God dealt with me about how the word works. Because I'm going, I know the right answer, but I wasn't living the right answer. All right? And so are some of you, if you're honest, you don't live the right answer. We're all in the process of learning to live the right answers. But most people can quote the right answers if you've been around church long enough. But here's what he showed me, that, the, um, that in Jeremiah 1, 9 and 10, and he took me to the school of uh, slapping me around a little bit. And it was good for me. It's still good for me. It's good for you, too. If it's good for me, it's good for you, right? All right. Jeremiah 1, 9 and 10. Then the Lord put forth his hand to my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold... Remember, Tom taught us what behold means. To focus with a sustained, oh, there you are, sustained. You hold it. You embrace it. You take it in. All right? Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdom. Now, this was to Jeremiah the prophet. But what he was saying is, I put my words in there, and these words are supposed to do something, but these words are also supposed to penetrate you <laughs> so that you own them. And he says, and here, here's the key, to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, build and plant. You know what most of us as Christians do? We want to build and plant. We want to go for the, go for the good stuff. And he's saying, I'm telling you, there's certain things that are not going to take place until you allow the word to work the way it was meant to work. And it was meant to uh, root out. And what is he rooting out? Topic today, weed seed attitudes. Not just a fleeting attitude, a weed seed attitude. That's something that's grown up in you and needs to be dealt with. You want to see a healthy church. See people that actually deal with their attitude and not cover up with some religious behavior. Root out weed seed attitudes. Now, what's interesting is this portion of scripture names... Um, 
five elements root out pull down destroy throw down build and plant in those five elements it alternates from planting to building but did you notice we build and plant after that other stuff is taken care of a farmer's going to plant a crop he better not have any johnson grass in there or it's a waste of time i'm wondering why doesn't it work for me it works for other people's because you didn't root out the stuff to make the ground pliable and receptive. Like in Mark chapter 4 when you read about the parable of the soils. That's what that's having to do with the preparation of the heart. Why do some get 30, 60, 100 fold and others fall away? It's the condition of the heart. The condition of the soil of the heart. In other words, it's how you receive. Receiving. Now, root out the weed seed attitude. When you root out the attitude you're going for when did that get started in my life because a weed you gave place to it at some point in your life we're talking about weed seed attitudes that means you've had that for a period of time it wasn't just something that popped in your head today and never before all right the second part is pull down to pull down our strongholds or seats of authority. We're to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Strongholds are mental thoughts that are fortified with a poisonous root. Where we've seen success in all the years uh, of ministry to this day, everything that's ever changed anybody was because they dealt with the root issue, not just the surface issue. Putting band-aids on doesn't really work, doesn't last long. So now we're starting out with root out. What are we talking about? We're talking about the soil of the heart, root out. Pull down, now we're talking about building. God wants to build something in your life. And he's saying, I've got to pull down strongholds. I've got to pull down arguments and high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Isn't that what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5? We use the message translation sometimes, but... Uh, that we, we use our powerful God tools for fitting every loose thought, emotion, and impulse. There you go, all three, into a structure of a life that's shaped by Jesus. Our tools are ready and at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building, there's your building, a life of obedience to the place of maturity. So what it's saying is, uh, something that we've taught for years, which is a little contrary to sometimes a lot of churches. A lot of churches, you've got one person doing all the ministry, where we've always equipped people, which is really what the scripture says, but it's kind of lacking, uh, and that is uh, God placed apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. So I've seen people in, in both camps here where one would say, everyone in our church, Kingdom Life, has learned how to go to God for themselves. And that's true, because that's lacking. Most are depending on somebody to be their source of, of input and instruction all the time. Uh, you don't make someone else God. You don't make them the total source. You make God the source. Now, every now and then, because you are prone to pride, all of us, it says, confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. There is a time to get ministry from somebody. But ministry is to get to the root. Not to do old-fashioned secular counseling where you talk about it all day long. That's venting. That is non-redemptive. As a matter of fact, you fortify it. Without repentance and forgiveness, you only fortify your problems. I actually killed them in the wilderness with the six deadly seas. They complained. They murmured. They weren't doing anything about it. They were just talking about it. Talk by itself doesn't accomplish anything. So he's saying, root out the weed seed attitude. What happens when you root out a weed seed attitude is you deal with the power behind the thought. I've watched people struggle with renouncing lies, and it didn't seem like it was working because they didn't get the root attitude right. They didn't get the emotional part to where peace was ruling. When peace is ruling, Who's ruling when peace is ruling in your life? Jesus is ruling. Let the peace of God rule. Then he's ruling. 
When peace is not ruling, something else is taking place. So if you re are going to renounce a lie effectively, if you're really going to pull down a stronghold, you have to receive forgiveness for the negative emotion, the toxic emotion, deal with the root, then when you renounce the lie, and it's probably one of the most beautiful things to watch, and we've seen this over the years, and when it's actually done from the heart, not just theory, not a method, but when the lie is renounced, the truth of God's word replaces it. And it's, they kind of have that aha moment where all of a sudden scripture they've known their whole Christian life now is no longer a mystery, but it's getting written on the tablet of their heart. It's being an implanted and rooted. But why? Because you received forgiveness for the toxicity. You repented, got clean on the inside. When you get clean on the inside, you have the authority to renounce the lie. You renounce the lie, you've got now the opportunity in the heart to receive the truth. Because I've seen pe people that knew the truth, but it wasn't taken hold. Because there's something in the way, and until that's gone, all right? So pull down, is, uh, everybody's familiar with that scripture in 2 Corinthians 10. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, bringing every thought captive. Every argument, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So you can't just know the right answers. You've got to have an internal win over that battle. Then, look at this. The third element is destroy. Now remember I said it alternates between planting and building? Destroy. You have to destroy the soil for weeds. That's a good destruction. In other words, once you pulled out the old root, you've got to fertilize that ground of the heart for God's seed. So now you've rooted out the weed, you got the, the, the mental stronghold down, you pull that down, now God can build into your life maturity and truth and reality and scripture can now be written on the tablet of your heart. But it also says that now the heart is prepared to receive truth. It's fertilized. It's like, uh, what do we used to say, weed and feed. It's kind of like it kills the weeds, but it makes the, the good stuff grow better. So that's the throw, the, the destroy part. Now, when you destroy the, the soil of your heart for only good seed to be planted, you're making room for God. And you more than likely start getting more and more revelation, more and more insight. All of a sudden, it's like the scriptures are going to come alive and you're going to feel stuff quickened all the time because the soil of the heart is ready for hundredfold returns. You know, it's good shape. I'm not going to talk this farm talk yet. Whatever a farmer does to get that soil in good shape, all right, the word of God will do this to your heart. All right. Now, the next word is, is if I destroy the ground and now my heart's fertile, the next word says throw down. In other words, when these strongholds come down, they used to say that when they took a city in, in battle and, the, and they would knock the walls down flat, they would actually build something beautiful on top of that. Well, you know what? God can do that. He can make beauty for ashes, right? He can, take, he can take that stronghold that's interfered with your life, defiled others, bring it down, and then build something beautiful on it, and it'll be the opposite. And that's really what a testimony is in reality. A testimony is nothing more than uh, here's a weakness, repented of it, God's going to build that to become a strength. Now, you throw down a stronghold of those lies, it makes way for the truth. You can build truth on top of that now. So we went from root out, planting, to pull down, structure, building, to destroy, back to planting, getting that soil ready, throw down, take that stronghold down, and you're making it ready for the truth to rise up and rule and reign and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Then the scripture says, build and plant. 
what God told me as a baby Christian was, we've gone too quick to try to build and plant without pulling down lies that are contrary to the truth and preparing the heart and getting rid of weed, <laughs> weed seed attitudes. You've got to get rid of the weed seed attitudes. And actually the weed seed attitude shows us the importance of the pitfall of not paying enough attention to your emotions. Your emotions, you don't live by toxic emotions, but they can be your friends and tell you that Jesus isn't ruling right now. Whether it's hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, Jesus isn't ruling right now. God, when he builds and plants, and Jennifer's done a whole series on this, when he builds and plants, he only builds with Zoe life. If you look at the, the book of Revelation, you look at the end, what that beautiful temple is built out of good things. And the only thing that can, your self-effort doesn't really accomplish anything. It's dead works. When he builds, it must be life. So to build in you life, it has to be real from the inside. It has to be Zoe life. And what is real from the inside? It's that which passes through death yet lives. Resurrection life is Zoe life. Those things, like mind, will, and emotions, were never meant to be destroyed. They were meant to be subordinate to the Zoe kind of life so that God could blow the wind of his spirit through it and you would operate out of that more than anything else. And so I think this is something, I, if, if I were a, a, a Christian and I really wanted to take the development of my character serious, I would take these five points because they never grow old. Take these five points and say, I'm not just dealing with the day-to-day -day stuff. I'm dealing with, uh, show me. Be like David, who, instead of building a case for himself, said, search me, O oh God, for secret faults. <clears throat> now, what would, what would secret faults be? They were secret to David. It wasn't like, search me, O oh God, for the, for the secrets that I'm keeping from you, God, <laughs> like that would work. Uh, he's saying, search me for secret faults, those things that I don't know is there, because in that psalm, it says, if you search me for those and I deal with them, then I won't commit more presumptuous sin. So in other words, uh, in the early church, they called it fences and before the New Testament was written, uh, the Jewish influence, all the apostles were Jewish, by the way, they all were taught by Jesus, but they also taught fences. Fences was uh, adultery, murder, does not just fall out of the sky and you suddenly, it started with lust and anger and unresolved. If you would resolve the little foxes and deal with it while it's still a fence, you won't see those other things take the place. So when you see the other things take place, it's because the little things were never properly dealt with. They could have been putting on their Christian face, but they didn't really deal with root issues. Now, so here's, here's what the Lord said. This is the challenge for me. This is the challenge for you. And this is the way he challenged me. I actually think if I'd have went the first two years I was a Christian, went to Bible school, it would have been easier. Because God was harder on me than Bible school was. <laughs> He said, okay, Dennis, now I'm telling you the truth about bad attitudes, so we're going to deal with your bad attitudes. And you can't say, I don't have any. Let, let me search. Let me pick the cherries. <laughs> you know, let, me, let me look. Let me search your heart. And you know the funny thing is he always found something. I've never had a day in prayer that God didn't find something in me that needed work. Nothing, ever. And if you have, you might need to ask God that prayer. Search me, oh God. You pick the cherries. All right. But he says, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to speak to you the word of God, and it's going to be clear. Morning by morning, I'm going to awaken your ear, Isaiah 50. I'm going to awaken your ear to hear. I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple, but you, can't have, you don't have nothing to say until you've heard something. And you don't have nothing to give if you haven't received it. So you've got to receive with meekness what he's saying. And what he's speaking right now is bad attitudes. Weed seed attitudes are going to adversely affect your relationships and the function of what God wants to accomplish in the process of building. So he said, here's the three things. 
and this is good for you, it's good for me. I'm going to give you a truth, number one. This has to do with attitude. I'm going to give you the truth. I'm going to show you how to cultivate it. I'm not just going to tell you the right answers. I'm going to show you how to cultivate the right answers. And lastly, I'm going to hold you accountable to tell me if you see any result. Is there any fruit? In other words, did it work? Hey, Dennis, when I told you about this, this, and this, and I showed you how to cultivate it, did it work? But I do know that when it works, God will reaffirm it. When it doesn't work, it'll be kind of obvious. I remember my attitude toward yard work was horrible. And God was saying, oh, Dennis, you worship, blah, 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 and you got the victory over the enemy, and you did this, and you did that. And it, oh, that's all wonderful, but when you do yard work, you're like a cranky old man. And I wasn't even old then. I'd make a better cranky old man now, now I'm old. All right? But he says, you're like a cranky old man. And so I realized that when I went outside, I had an attitude. Even if I didn't talk, you know, you're cutting the grass. Come on, you know when you have an attitude without talking. And I'm out there, and I'm getting real guilty that that's what God was saying. And so I received forgiveness, and I tried to just worship him while I was doing what I didn't like to do. That's a good cure right there. And, but it has to be real. It still has to be real. You still have to deal with the root attitude. And as soon as I dealt with it and felt like the peace of God was really ruling in that area, and I'm going, I feel like I'm changed, which is what God was saying. I'm going to teach you how to cultivate it, then I'm going to ask you, did it work? And, and I want honesty here. Did it work? And I said, yeah, I feel changed. The neighbor called up and said, my husband's going to cut your grass for you the rest of your life. <laughs> That's the way it sounded. Because... He wanted a riding lawnmower, and his wife said, your yard is not big enough for a riding lawnmower, unless you go do Pastor Dennis's. Then you can get a riding lawnmower, but your yard's not big enough to be riding around. You can still use a push mower and get yours done. Well, then Dennis has got a little bigger yard. You can go do his too. Oh, does that pay to do it right? Does it pay to let God search your heart? Even if nobody else knows, that you had an attitude out there pushing that lawnmower. Bleh. Huh? Doesn't it work? But what did he say? I'm going to give you a truth. I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that truth. And then I'm going to ask you, is it working or not? Wow. Just think if we were all that honest with our relationship with him. The truth was that I was pleasantly surprised at how powerful forgiveness was that when you receive forgiveness, all of a sudden it's cleansing on the inside. But you have to make sure that you've got the root issue, not just asking for forgiveness. The root, because you can ask for forgiveness, would you want to ask for forgiveness 20 times in one day? When God was first teaching me, that forgiveness is available, and I was a young Catholic. I thought you had to go to the priest. <laughs> but then I found out, no, you don't have to. It's right in the Word of God. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins. So I thought that was good. But then I'm going, God, I've been asking for forgiveness all day long. i got to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when he starts showing about roots. When you deal with a root, it takes all the ugly tentacles with it. I'm going, this is a good deal. I could see why a farmer, not that I know anything, would want to get the roots out of the field before they planted anything, because it would choke it out. Doesn't that say that in Mark 4, that the, that the Word of God can be choked out by all of your fleshly desires and wants? So God's saying, the truth is, forgiveness is the solution. Every time I had a stinky attitude... If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. All sin. The key was to stay connected. And I found out that you could ask for forgiveness repeatedly in order to stay connected, but then God was saying, if you dealt with the root issues, you, 
you would find that those periods of time get farther and farther apart and you start walking in the light that you have. That light increases. Don't you like that idea of knowing that you're not blowing it every two seconds, but it gets farther and farther apart? That's actually sanctification, but it's also practicing the presence of God. That's also a walk in the Spirit. And forgiveness cleanses you and prepares you, but if you don't deal with root issues, it's much harder work. You can do like I did. I can't go to work now because I've been asking for forgiveness for every 15 minutes. I had another thought. Oh, there's another one. Oh, oh there's another one. It's like, I can't get nothing done like this. Huh? All right. But the fruit was that this attitude of continual forgiveness, uh, you, you learn to stay connected. And practicing the presence of God is not some uh, theory, but it becomes a reality. Now, I don't know about you, but I wanted to, during this season of learning, I wanted to become usable to God by getting myself out of the way so that he could get his life through me. That's how you would do it. How else is he going to get his life through you? He can't get through the, he can't get through the forest of weeds <laughs> and then say, I don't know why it's not working. Well, maybe because of the weeds. So the Lord wanted me to have a good attitude no matter what. And the person that did me wrong is still the object of God's love. That I believe with all my heart. The one thing I found out was with all of the correction that God gave in my life to where I was asking for forgiveness every hour on the hour, it was always love was behind it. It was not to be feared. And that when he confronted me, he confronted me with, with the truth that I needed to change. And Every person that ever wronged me is still the object of God's love. Even the person that uh, God wants his attitude to become my attitude. I can still remember that guy who, um, he was a young guy, he was trained under Catherine Coleman in the healing ministry, he was a good man, but he sure didn't like me, and he wrote articles about me. And every time I read the article, I get that, well, you know, somebody writes an article about you, you get that sinking feeling in there. Uh, and you could feel the hurt and the pain in it. And I would release forgiveness until the hurt and the pain left. And I could feel a flow going out toward them. I did that, I did that for a whole week. Now, what most people do in the flesh is you try to justify yourself. You try to make an explanation, all that. that, that, that none of that works. And then when I read the article, it says, part one of three. Oh, no. <laughs> but it came out weekly. So that means, okay, well, you're forgiving him and releasing love to him. You've got to wait and see what he has to say next week. And then the week after that, not fun. And every time I kept praying and releasing, it got better and better and I could feel love flowing out toward him and uh, you could see I'd see him around town and stuff and what have you and we were both young real young in ministry um, and then one day years later I'm at a pastor's meeting uh, all the local pastors came together which is good because iron sharpens iron and uh, you're, you're with peers that are living what you're living, dealing with sheep, sheeples. <laughs> and actually, there's nothing new under the sun, really. Sometimes we change the name, but it's the same old, same old stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, he stood up and he burst out crying in the middle of the pastor's meeting. And he hardly get his words out. <laughs> and he just says... He said, uh, uh, I just want to, rip. I, he said, I persecuted uh, Pastor Dennis publicly. He said, I want to apologize publicly. This is after like 10 or 12 years. <laughs> and he said, but the thing that he remembered was that I knew that I knew when I saw him that I had thoroughly released that situation. It took several weeks before I knew that I knew it was all gone. 
Uh, I mean, you can forgive instantly, but knowing that any root issues, any leftovers are gone, takes a while. And when I'd see him around town, I never felt uh, 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 ill will on the inside, never felt anything bad. Well, when he was crying, he says, the problem is, he says, I not only attacked him publicly, but he said, all the years in between then and now, every time I saw him, he was nothing but a perfect gentleman to me. And so that should be all of our testimonies. Hmm? We've got to get to the point where, to me, I was challenged, I think our whole church was challenged, uh, by the Didache. That's before we had a New Testament, and they were the apostles of Jesus. And they only had Old Testament and what Jesus told them. Nothing was really written down yet. And they had a little training manual to deal with Gentiles, people that had no Jewish background, no Ten Commandments, no nothing. And in this, they would tell them that, that fast and pray for your enemies. Because what happens if you do it right, your heart changes toward them. And you see that they are the victim, not you. When you attack somebody, you, you, you're see, still seeing yourself as the misunderstood, rejected victim. But when you fast and pray for them, well, I shared that with uh, some pastors. They said, oh, I don't know if Christians even pray, fast and pray for their friends, <laughs> yet, alone, yet alone their enemies. But what it does was, the point was, this will change. This was to the Gentiles. Gentiles that had no, no, no biblical training whatsoever that came out of uh, all kinds of uh, weird uh, doctrines and beliefs, ten gods and what have you, uh, leave babies out in the cold to die because you didn't want a girl. I mean, that's what the way they were raised. That was normative. So now you're saying fast and pray for your enemies because what will happen, it will change your heart the way you see them, and you'll see them as the ones that really need Jesus. You're not the, you're not the victim. They are. But it has to change your heart before you see like that, right? Are we all going to see like that? Do we all want to see like that? So it says, uh, if we love our enemies, how much more important is it to love fellow believers? If we don't see more Jesus in them as bigger than their faults, then we are sinning. If we don't see more Jesus in them, bigger than their faults. And that don't mean you don't confess your faults one to another. It simply means that you still got to see the Jesus in them. It's got to be like when God corrected me. I was corrected, but it was, it was love correcting me for my own good. To rethink some things that you think you had a handle on. That's what he does with believers. More often than not, he doesn't correct you for blatant stuff. He corrects you for for the idolatry of the things that you just feel are righteous, when it's really self-righteousness and pride. Now, what was it? Um, was it Norman Grubb in the revival in Africa? Now, this is real repentance. I like this. He found that he repented and things changed and the anointing was maintained, and this is what we're looking for, for a greater unity, and particularly upon our leadership, of which I confront, and they know it, for that unity. I don't want anybody in leadership that doesn't know how to deal with stuff, honestly. But it says, Norman Grubb repented when he recognized to even say we dislike is a watered-down version for hate. And the scriptures say, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. He who loves his brother abides in light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness, walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What did... Um, 
What did Jesus say to Paul when he called him? I want you to turn the people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. And I'll bet you most of them felt like they were okay. <laughs> Paul was okay before his conversion. He was doing his duty. <laughs> but it goes on to say, have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Jesus. Uh, some of your uh, translations will say, had this mind that was also in Jesus. Mind, the better translation is attitude. Have this disposition of the heart, not just your thoughts. Have this, uh, and so when we renew our minds, the Greek word is nous, N-O-U-S, which means mind, will, and emotions, the entire mindset. Your entire disposition needs to be impacted by the Spirit of God, not just one, not just your thinking, your mind, your will, and your emotions. You were bought with the price, you're not your own, all three of those belong to him. You can't just give him one and think he's going to be happy. All right. So it says, have this attitude that was in Jesus. Though he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself further by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. We got, a, uh, I think, a marvelous teaching that God... Uh, revealed to us about core values. If you haven't ever studied that, it's on the online school. We've got material in the bookstore. But the core values, uh, that portion of Scripture, if you really had His attitude, if you really had Jesus' attitude, there's four core values. They can be a strength in your life, but they can also be a double weakness. What do I mean by that? I mean that you can take it and run with it in the flesh, okay? I see it all the time, the flesh version in church. Uh, but you want the spiritual version. The four things that are in that portion of Scripture, there's four core qualities. One, equality. He made himself of no reputation. I see people promoting themselves, wanting to make a name for themselves, looking for a platform rather than serve. Right? Equality. The second one is personal freedom. That's Jennifer and I's. Everybody has a tendency to lean toward one of these more than the other. Okay? Jennifer and I, personal freedom. If, if you want to put some pressure on us in the flesh, just uh, micromanage us or look over our shoulder. If Jennifer's at the computer, just go look over her shoulder and she'll feel like, Helicopter husband is just now evaluating what I'm typing, and I need my space. <laughs> All right? So that's a good quality, personal freedom. But you can pervert it by, I'm free. I don't, I don't submit anywhere. I don't belong. I don't need to. I'm part of the whole body of Christ. I'm a floater. I'm a lone ranger. But a personal freedom is probably a core value that's just not properly interpreted. But it's a good thing, personal freedom. Equality is a good thing, but if you're always demanding your rights, you've got the equality thing a little overboard. All right, equality, personal freedom, and then loyalty. What was his? I mean, he literally emptied himself and took on the form of a bond servant. There's your personal freedom. Bond servant means he did it by choice. Nobody made him do it. He chose to serve wasn't afraid to, to lay down that personal freedom, give up his rights, so to speak, and emptied himself even further, being in the likeness of man, he humbled himself, obedient to the point of death. Now, I'd say that's loyalty, wouldn't you? Obedient to the point of death. That's not for something for you to lay on someone else. That's something for you to do. <laughs> you be obedient to the point of death. Loyalty means something to some people. Some people it doesn't. Uh, loyalty can be defined by an act of the heart that's saying, I'm going to feel that way even when reconciliation is not possible. I can still be loyal to love. 
right? I can be loyal to love, not necessarily reconciled in some relationship because guess what? Some people don't want reconciled. And there's not a thing you can do about that. Forgiveness, though, is absolute. Forgiveness can be unilateral one way. Reconciliation requires two. And trust has to be reestablished before that's even real. But forgiveness, Jesus didn't wait for a response. He unilaterally, one way from the cross, said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I don't know who responded, who didn't. But at that time, he was releasing that that. You are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be forgiving people. I don't know if you will or not, but you should be. I would love to see a much higher level of, of, uh, of Christianity in the, in the local church with the honesty and the forgiveness. Um, people that say they don't have issues and have issues. You know, that kind of dishonesty is not going to get far. Especially when there's a solution. But it's got to be real. It's got to be the weed seed attitudes, not just saying the right answer. Now, <clears throat> equality, personal freedom, loyalty. And the last one, this one's kind of, a, I shouldn't say it's funny because it's a lot. But right now with all of the hostility in our culture, uh, if you have a core value of justice, yikes. But Jesus showed us the attitude that was in him about justice was he was the just and he died for the unjust. There was a demonstration of love and an attitude. But those that have a strong justice core value are probably having a very difficult time right now demanding. Off with their heads. <laughs> huh? Jennifer's not here. You got a strong justice core value too. She likes to see that Justice, no nonsense, no play games, no play church. Right? So you got personal freedom and justice. I got friends that the husband is mercy and the wife is justice. It's interesting to see them work through issues. <laughs> no, we're going to extend. <laughs> so, anyway. But can you see those core values have their good point? but you can also abuse them. Any good character quality can have a, a, a flip side. Equality can be pushed to the limit to where it doesn't even make sense anymore. Personal freedom can be nothing but a rebel. Um, loyalty can be total dysfunction. <laughs> huh? I've seen what was called loyalty, which was really, you know what, that's not loyalty. That They would have been better off standing on their own two feet and you not doing it for them. That's when the mothers start throwing stuff, when they're trying to live their life through their kids. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to him, not to you. Romans 14.4 in the Living Bible, you got to read that one. It'll make you mad or make you glad, one of the two. They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to him and not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong. I know you think you're the message to tell them right or wrong, but not always. In some cases, you just got to let, let them find out for themselves. Right? Isn't that true of teenagers? There's a point where they better listen to you because they're under your roof. And you're responsible. But there comes a time when... Good or bad, they're going to start making their own decisions and you're going to learn to live with it. You're not going to like all of it. But then there's an opportunity for you to be looking for the redemption where there can be redemption, but you can't force redemption. No more than you can save anybody. All right? So even in the natural, we have good and bad attitudes. The attitude God asks of us, however, is that where his will crosses our will. And when the Lord was teaching me this about attitude determines performance. I mean, that's a good statement. You know, you, if you forget the whole message, don't forget that. Your attitude will determine how you perform. And he was telling me that there's positive and negative attitudes, correct? Everybody knows that. Unsaved people know that. There's positive and negative attitudes. 
But he says the attitude he's talking about, have this attitude that was in Jesus, is a redemptive attitude that is Zoe kind of life, and it's where your will and his will crosses. It's to, it ought to be an actual work of the cross that is the true positive. You know, you see the little negative sign, a little plus sign, but the cross is true positive. That's a good way to remember it. The cross. In other words, your, your attitude has to pass through death, yet live on the other side. It gets redeemed. That attitude of his will crosses your will, and his will prevails. You know, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. I have food that you know not of. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. All right? This is the true work of the cross. That's the true positive. And every time God works it out in our life, we yield to his lordship. We carry an anointing in that area. Every time we fail in an area, there's no anointing there. We need to pick it up and let him put an anointing in that area. And he can. So the two strategies are forgiveness and release. Why did I say forgiveness and release? Because when you forgive, you let go. I can remember discerning of spirits comes very, very easy. So when people give me an argument, I go with what their gut's saying more than what their head's saying. All right? And Jennifer, when I was teaching her about releasing, she was concerned. At that time, uh, her daughter was a teenager. <laughs> and and uh, need I say more? Okay, she was a teenager. <laughs> um, and I was getting Jennifer to release her into the loving hands of God. She was misbehaving, yes, but she wasn't really listening. And there wasn't much you could do at that transitional point in her life. So I prayed with Jennifer to let her go. That's not irresponsible parenting. It's responsible parenting when you release them into the loving hands of God, the one who can be there when you can't. Come on, parents. You know what that means. You can't be there all the time. And I had Jennifer release, and it didn't feel like it. And I'm going, so finally after a while I said, Jennifer, say out loud what you're doing. I'm releasing Allison as long as she don't get pregnant. <laughs> That's not release. You might be thinking you're forgiving, but you're still hanging on. Forgiveness includes a release. As a matter of fact, that's how you know what loving intercession is. Loving intercession is that after you forgive, what you feel flowing out of you is out of my belly's flowing rivers of living water. You feel the love. Loving intercession can't have uh, walls and stuff in the way. That stuff has to come out first. I remember that my first church, I that lady... My daughter smoking them cigarettes. I just wish to God that she'd burn her lips off. <laughs> I don't think she was really into the prayer yet. <laughs> All right? But God's basically saying today, loving forgiveness, loving release is absolutely necessary. You really have to let some things go. If you want to keep pounding away at something, it's, it's your control that's the problem. Forgiveness lets go. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And it has to be a genuine work of the cross. I'm going to give you a real quick, real quick solution for the pitfall of weed seed attitudes. You ask God, where did it start? Forgive. Renounce. Ask Him what's the truth. And then let the truth be written on the tablet of your heart. That's the solution for a bad attitude. Where did it start? Forgive. Renounce. Any stronghold. What is the truth, God? And let it be written on the tablet of my heart. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. 
Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.